If L1 and L2 are regular languages, then so are their union, concatenation, and star closure. Is this also true if these are context-free languages? We hope so, but let's prove it. So suppose the context-free grammars for L1 and L2 are as indicated. So let's consider the union. L1 union L2 would be the union of two languages. So we could write down the four tuple and decide what each component is. So what's the start symbol for our combined language? Remember, it's convenient to think of the start symbol as a string in the language. And this means that our start symbol for the combined language shouldn't be S1 or S2, since we should regard these as strings in L1 or L2. So we'll introduce a new symbol, SU. Next, let's consider our variables. Again, we want to be the union of the two languages. However, crossovers are muy malo. Suppose a variable A appears in the grammar for both L1 and L2. Since the production rules might differ, we need to know which language A is actually from. We could avoid this problem if we relabel the variables so that the variable sets are disjoint. This essentially prevents us from switching languages once we're in one of the two grammars. Consequently, our production rule can be the combined production rules, again after relabeling the variables. But wait, there's more. We also need to introduce a rule that puts us in one of our two languages. Essentially, given a string, we have to know which language it's from. And so we can do this with the rule SU produces either the start symbol of S1 or the start symbol of S2. The terminal states in our combined language would be the terminal states of L1 and the terminal states of L2. So the terminal states of our union is the union of the terminal states. Or is it... Remember, with variables, we required, relabeling as necessary, that the sets of variables be disjoint. Do we need to do the same thing with terminal symbols? So let's consider. A terminal symbol common to both languages might follow different production rules. For example, the letters I, L, Y, and A are in both French and English. However, you can construct this in French, but not English. But no production rule uses a symbol, so it doesn't matter if both languages use the same terminal symbols. Capiche? And because of this, our set of terminal symbols can just be the union of the two sets of terminal symbols. Also because of this, we often assume that these sets of terminal symbols are actually the same. To prove that the context-free grammar we just described corresponds to the context-free language that is the union of the two, let's consider some string in one of the languages. Since it's in L1, we know that we can go from the start symbol of L1 to X, where we'll use this notation to indicate that the rules we're applying are the production rules for P1. But remember, our combined language also includes the production rule start symbol to either S1 or S2. So this will be the first step in our production. And now that we're in the start symbol for L1, we know there's a production of X. And so X is going to be in our combined language. And similarly, if X is in L2. Now suppose X is in our combined language. Then there must be a production rule, SU, start symbol of our combined language, to X. But the only thing we can do with that start symbol is to drop it into S1 or S2. And so we either have SU drops into S1 and then produces X using the grammar rules for our first language, in which case X is in the first language, or 
SU drops into S2 and produces X using the grammar rules from the second language, in which case X is in our second language. And so X is in either L1 or L2, completing the proof.